Hello and welcome to our LinkedIn Live around unpacking NHS Derby and Derbyshire. Listen to our thoughts and feelings from an informed perspective on how well our delivery went. My name is Natasha Bradley and I'm Head of Sales and Marketing here and I'm extremely excited to be joined by Jeff Williams and Eleanor Ferris. Jeff, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. So I'm the M365 Training Lead and Adoption Specialist at the Inform Team. Fabulous. Eleanor? I'm the internal delivery manager at Inform, so I tend to get involved at the beginning of pieces of work and help pull things together. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much for joining me. And guys, all I can say is, wow, um, two years since our relationship started with NHS Derby and Derbyshire ICB. Um, you know, I can't, I can't quite believe it, um, but you know this account's got a really special place in my heart and, you know, for everyone else out there, this relationship started by a LinkedIn post over two years ago and really just grown from, from strength to strength over the last two years. So it just goes to show that you can create strong strategic relationships using LinkedIn. But then the rest is history. So let's have a look, um, you know, what's happened over the last two years. Jeff, what's your earliest memory of, uh, of working with Derby? So we'd actually already been working with Derby for a little while before I uh, got involved, but I started um, helping out with the analysis uh, part of a, a training needs analysis that we'd run on uh, uh, their care home estate. And Eleanor, I know you've been at from the beginning, so what's your earliest memory? It was the easy chats. At the very, very, very beginning, we used to have calls with Jed and with Umar, and it was the rapport was there right from the beginning. It was really easy, those calls. I used to look forward to them. No, I, I can totally concur with that. The team there are fabulous to work with. They're so easy. Not always, you know, let's be honest, not always easy to get hold of because they're, they're stretched and busy, <laughs> as we all know. But, you know, when you do get a hold of them, they're, they're really a great team team to work with. And and I think, you know, from our sort of first sort of engagement, we support the ICB to to look at their care homes and um, so within Darby they had 300 care homes and really to understand the digital landscape of where they were today so Ellen I know I know you were involved in that and that was that was quite tough I mean one thing that I sort of learned was just getting someone to answer the phone from a care home was challenging what's yeah. your what's your what's what comes to do you mind when you think of the, of the people so, that we did at the very very beginning we we knew the number of care homes and that's kind of it. And we had enough people within our organization to enough to understand that we didn't know stuff. You know, we knew that we needed more of an understanding. We needed to know the, the scale of them because a care home isn't just the same as every other care home. There's big ones, there's small ones, there's, there's care homes in groups, there's care homes all over the place. So the first thing to do was to understand what the individual makeup was at Derby. So we did uh, we did some discovery work um, to make sure that we we got an understanding of of how the staff are in each one and what the staff turnovers like and that was particularly important because in an organisation where there's low staff turnover you then plot a, a plan with your training but when you've got high staff turnover you need to keep making sure that the new people coming in are getting that same training and that you don't forget the onboarding when you've been with them for a while. Fabulous. And I think, I think if we had to do it again, that same exercise, is there any learnings that we can, we can take away from it? Um, I think, yeah, number one, there were, there were a few things. Because the NHS Derby is made up of the ICB as well as care homes, as well as GPs, we made a few assumptions. Now, we all know that you need to make sure that your assumptions are sound. So we asked a bunch of questions and found that actually no other assumptions weren't sound. We may we assumed that the care people, the people I used to say who do the caring, which I know, you know, the ICB obviously care about their people as well. Um, but the people focused on care, the GPs, the care homes, those people, we made the assumption that they might be less au fait with, with IT and Microsoft apps and that the ICB people, the people who predominantly work in an office, would have a better understanding. So we needed to ground that out and find out if it's true. And we, we did, and we carried out a, a piece of analysis and we understood that actually not a bit of it, the level of understanding of the Microsoft apps was very consistent across the whole piece. 
which meant that where we'd been thinking about two different sets of deliverables, it actually needed to all be the one. And we needed to apply the same thinking across all of the audience. Yeah, and I think that's true. And, and just thinking about the care home piece of work, it's quite it was quite, quite challenging really, because from a, an ownership and perspective, you know, the local authority is is owns and is responsible for the care home, but for any just Derby and Derbyshire ICB to, to deliver a greater service, they had to sort of step in and do this work to find that. So I think that's quite a challenge for us because we had these two sort of stakeholders all, all trying to deliver something in terms of the care homes, um, and but not any of it. And there's the way they talk to each other as well, because one of the biggest problems I remember Jed had in the early days is that it was Wi-Fi in the care home. You can't deliver an online training session without Wi-Fi in the care home. But Wi-Fi at the time was the responsibility of the care home, not the ICB. So the ICB had no control over that. And yeah. that was one of the, there were quite a few little things like that in the early days that we, we just kept on picking these little issues that, not very little, but issues in different areas. Yeah, and it was, it was when someone said to me, they said, but they're not answering their emails. We send them lots of emails. And it's yeah. like, the penny sort of dropped and was like, but they don't have Wi-Fi. So you could be emailing them, but they ain't going to be answering. And that's why they've not done all these things that, that you want them to do. Um, so I think you touched upon the training needs analysis. And that's where you did come in, Jeff, to, to support from a training needs analysis. So can you talk, Jeff, about the training needs analysis, what the benefit is, what you found out, etc.? Yeah, so the uh, training needs analysis is really to understand where people are at with in terms of their knowledge of all the different uh, Microsoft apps in particular. Obviously, it can include other things, but we were focusing uh, primarily on uh, on that. And as Eleanor said, there was a really broad uh, sort of spread uh, between the uh, the different parts of the organisation. So um, that obviously then led on to uh, developing training plans and so on and so forth. But that training needs analysis is really the uh, the starting point to to know what you're dealing with, really what what the requirements are. It gave us a few other bits as well, didn't it, Jeff? Because we made a point in that TNA, that analysis, to ask questions around geographical location, yeah. but also people's preferences. And it's something we've noticed pre-COVID days. If you ask the question, do you prefer in-person training or virtual training? People are going to say classroom. Nine, yeah, nine yeah. out of 10. I don't learn properly unless there's somebody in front of me helping me. That TNA at Derby, which of course was after COVID, was predominantly, I think from memory, it was something like 80, 75, 80% of people said, I do not want classroom training. And they, would, they talked about those things about impact on your day, you know, and the travel cost and parking my car and finding the right location and da, 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 da. So it was really interesting to get that vibe, that feeling from the people. They wanted training and they wanted it delivered virtually. So it meant that they were able to meet their needs. Yeah, I think it's really good, though, because, you know, from what you're just talking about, the training is analysis. It's like, you know, I know Derby's got the, the digital strategy and and their, their focus is really on upskilling, upskilling their people. And that does fit across not only the ICB, but the PCNs and the GPs, etc. So I think it's a really good thing. You know, and that obviously the trainees analysis gives them an insight of the baseline of where they are today. And I, and I do think other organizations, not only health, but across sector, could really learn from that um, mm. to get a baseline. Because, you know, how can we change things if we don't know where we're starting from? And so I think measuring. Yeah, and measurements. Yeah, measurements is, measurements is a good thing. So talking about measurements, Jeff, how did the output of the trainees analysis make the decision on the training that we were delivering? Well, basically, we took the output of that and then also took input from the ICB in particular around um, what their requirements were in terms of what they wanted their people, uh, which apps they wanted their people to be able to use uh, and so on and so forth, because not everybody has access to, to all of the apps. So it's there's no point delivering training on apps that people haven't got access to. That's kind of pointless. So it was using that output from the, the TNA, but also building in uh, the client's requirements, really, to make sure that we, we shaped it accordingly. Uh, and we actually decided to start with uh, a champions program. So we recruited a group of, uh, of champions and put them through some more extensive training, uh, and then they can act as a bit of a sort of secondary support mechanism for uh, for other people across the 
the organisation. And we've got sort of champions from both ICB, but also the primary care network and GP practices now as well. And do, do you know one of the things that we forgot to mention? That is the dreaded word of the shared tenant. So I'm sorry <laughs> if people listening, we, we love the shared tenant, but there is some there is some um, challenges that will come across, isn't it, Jeff? So I don't know if you want to touch upon some of the share, you know, the challenges we've had with the shared tenant and how, yeah. we, how we overcome them. Yeah, certainly. So with the, for those that don't know, with the shared tenant, you don't effectively have the same normal admin controls that you would have in a uh, an M365 tenant. So you can't install things like SharePoint framework apps that you would normally do so, uh, which we normally use as part of our champions uh, program, uh, ironically. Uh, so not being able to install those meant we had to come up with alternatives, workarounds, uh, if you like, different ways of, uh, of achieving a, a similar result. Uh, which we we managed to do so with the, uh, some funky use of uh, of SharePoint lists and specialist um, formatting of uh, uh, of the lists. So yeah, uh, we got there in the end. Yeah, which which is which is great, really. You know, and obviously the shared tenant, joking aside, you know, does does give them lots of great benefits. And um, mm. so I think you know, as long as we can overcome those challenges, then I think you know, working together with Derby, we managed to get there, which was which was great. So Absolutely. I've heard from many of the health trusts that you know recruiting champions from a gp perspective is a challenge now i know we've been down that route before you know we've had the challenges of of uncovering um or getting people from gps to sign up to champions can can you i don't know, I don't know jeff i'm not sure which one you want to go first but can we just talk about you know some of the comms we've done or we're doing around really helping gps obviously people from gps practices really to get involved in the champions program should I Go take on. that one? No, no, no. Probably, yeah. probably best. Um, so it's been really difficult, actually, partly because of the communication channels. So we don't have the same um, sort of centralised communication channels with the, the GP practices that you would typically have across the uh, the ICB. So it's been really has been a case of using every single channel that we we can do. Uh, and sometimes that's uh, sort of doing little mini presentations at, at their monthly PCN meetings. Sometimes it's by getting a few champions from GPs on board and, the, and then getting them to spread the word amongst their uh, their colleagues. Quite a lot of the GP practices are, are grouped into sort of super practices where you might have seven or eight GP practices all within one group. So if you can get one of those on board, then you can kind of spread out into the others uh, as well. Uh, but it hasn't been easy, I must admit, but we 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 have got there now. We're, you know, we're getting lots more GPs coming through and they're, they're really getting a lot of benefit out of the program, I think. Yeah, and I think I think we're quite lucky, to be honest, internally at Inform. Um, both of you know how wonderful I am at PowerPoints. Um, <laughs> um, so, you, you know, we, we are really lucky. We've, we've got a creative agency team who can turn anything into a really engaging um, content and look fabulous within brands. So I think they, that does help us from, a, from an organisational perspective to yes. understand as, the government noise. As Jeff was just saying there as well, though, because... Once you've got a few involved, because with the creative agency behind us and with all the messaging and with all of that support, once we start to get a few champions, then it grows. Yeah. So the challenge of recruitment of champions tends to diminish. You know, once you've got your first bunch engaged and, and being supported, they generally love it. So yeah. they do yeah. tell each other. And that, let's face it, word of mouth is the best advert of all, really, isn't it? Yeah. So, well, it's like it's it's you know not just champions program, but if we look in just you know in in, in everyday life, you know, I've been in many organisations where you're telling key stakeholders, you know, some of the things that could overcome some of the challenges. Yet they bring a consultant in from outside who tells exactly the same story, and they listen to them, and you're like, I've been telling you that for six months. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think. I think we can. I think we can all all take along those sort of lines of of, of how things differently communicated by different people are taken on board. And I think, you know, especially going back to the Derby case study, you know, it talk, they talk about the champions and how they spread words and to listen to their peers, etc. So I think I think you're right, Jeff. I think if we can get them on board, we can we can draft that. But you know, not an easy not an easy thing to do. But we are making progress, and I think that just goes to state showing the, the NHS Derby case study from that perspective. Absolutely. 
So I, I remember talking to to Jed, and for everyone who doesn't know, Jed is the um, if I get his title right, head of digital head of digital head of the digital uh, and information governance. I think in his title is. So apologies, Jed, if I haven't got that quite right, but <laughs> but but there you go. Um, so we, we you know we were having this conversation around um, learning learning uh, management platforms and you know the cost of them buying off the shelf and things, and you know that's how we came about. Oh, could we build that within Teams? And I know you have doing a lot of work. Um, Jeff around building an LMS within teams, not only for our sort of training, but for moving in all his training. So it's held in one sort of centralized point, really helping them drive maximum return of investment. Can you just give us a little bit of detail around how you've done that on the shared tenant, any challenges you've, you've had and how we've overcome that? Yeah, so that, uh, I kind of alluded to part of that uh, earlier on, but uh, but you're right. We built it all within Teams uh, using different components of the M365 stack, so Microsoft Forms, Power Automate, SharePoint, um, all coming together. Uh, but from the end user's perspective, they just have to go to one team and they'll see everything in there, whether that's uh, quick reference guides, whether that's video guides, uh, and also the uh, the knowledge checks that we build in uh, to validate that they've uh, they've learned what we were trying to teach them, uh, which of course they always do. Uh, but you're right; we're not only using it for, for Microsoft apps, but we're, we're also now going to start using it for cybersecurity training. And um, basically, it's a, can be used for, for literally anything that you can sort of produce training content on, uh, and just use a knowledge check to uh, to valid, validate their knowledge. Uh, again, one of the other challenges of the shared tenant that you can't you can't just install stuff. Uh, that you otherwise perhaps would do if you had full control over your uh, your own setup. Fabulous. Sorry, sorry, Tasha. One, one of the things I like about that tool as well that they're just talking about there is is the support that they can give each other, because it becomes a forum. So if one of those champions has a question they can't answer, they can come into that forum and then they can they can support each other and help each other to to learn more. So that and that just it grows as a knowledge base as time goes on, and also it's useful referring back to that high turnover as new champions come into the fold, they can get up to speed quite quickly because they've got a, all of their colleagues available to them. Yeah, I think that's I think it's a good way and it's a good way of being able to promote self adoption, isn't it, between each other and help and learn. So when we do walk away, then they can continue that cycle, which would be which is a really good thing. Well, we've talk, obviously spoke about loads of programs of work mm -hmm. and you know we're dealing with people who have got time constraints um we, we really need to be able to maximize our work to help them deliver the program so how would you how would you go about delivering multiple projects all at the same time the, the short answer is talking to people one of the things that informed us with we're a people first organization and you need to just keep talking to people and so long as you've got some real robust mechanism behind you so you can keep on top of where each one is you need to make sure you've got your plans in place we use microsoft teams for just about everything and love it because it's all in one place with each different thing and everybody needs to stay in the loop so coming back to derby we had issues with um, gps particularly but also the other care home staff's availability and you can't just call them to a meeting at 10 a.m and expect them to turn up you need to work around everybody else and you need to be flexible and you need to make sure that everybody's needs are being met. But basically, my short answer to pretty much anything is an Excel spreadsheet and talk to people. <laughs> so communication is key, we're saying, which oh, is which exactly. we all know communication is, is fabulously key. So we're coming up to sort of the 20 minute mark. So what I'd like to do is just last question is really to understand from you guys the top three things that you've learned from Derby, or you could give advice to our audience. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Go on. So, so top three things, one of them that, that you kind of alluded to earlier on, Tash, and I think I probably mentioned it, is people's availability. People are not in, in the care world, their days are not Monday to Friday, nine to five. So you need to make sure that what you can deliver, say to a council or to a government department or whatever, that all that you learn there is not relevant here. You need to rethink it and make sure that you're delivering what you need to deliver to the right audience at the right time. So that, that was one of the, the big ones. The high turnover of people. We had a list of care home managers and it turned out that 
lots of them were no longer the right person in that particular care home. If you've got a high turnover, you can't rely on having communicated something six months ago. Yeah, yeah. This is how the people won't see that. So that was something that that we we were we were quite mindful of because of that of that turnover and the scheduling, of course, for the training. You need to make sure that you've got onboarding stuff all the time. So that those would be my three my three things: commitment, um, turnover, and making sure that you've got the uh, the entry level comes. Thank you, Jeff. I think the first thing for me was that they needed help. So the digital team is really small uh, and they've got lots of users uh, and the Microsoft stack is pretty big and complex and uh, really they couldn't do it on their own. So it was was great to, to get involved and partner with them to, to help them on that journey, uh, if you like. Uh, second one probably kind of builds on that is that there was lots of potential. So having all of those tools available, but um, they weren't really being used at, at that point. So Teams was being used a little bit, but primarily for sort of meetings and chat. Um, and I guess the traditional apps, they were Outlook, Excel, were, were probably being used pretty much as they had been for, for years, but they weren't making taking advantage of all of the new stuff that we've got, or all of the new capabilities and, and so on. Um, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. I think, you know, there's an uphill battle when they move from a CCG to an ICB. The regions change, so you know they had to deliver services to a, a, a lot more people, which which obviously caused a lot more challenges, and they weren't quite ready ready for that. And that's where we need to support them from that perspective. So, I think I think they're in a, a much better place now, and you know they're f fabulous to work with. That's as you yeah, I was in the beginning. They're close to my heart, and as you can tell, <laughs> um, I agree completely. Yeah. So. Thank you ever so much for um, this session of Unpacking Derby and Derbyshire ICB. Um, it's been great to speak to you. And uh, if anyone's got any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. But thank you very much for listening. Thank Thanks. you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.